judges come from all sorts of different backgrounds and they're nominated by a president and they're confirmed by typically a supermajority of the Senate. And it doesn't matter what their race or sex or religion or orientation is or whether they came up as a federal prosecutor or a federal defender or a partner to white shoe law firm. They are a United States district judge. And unless there is a meritorious reason that they should recuse themselves or a meritorious reason that there should be a change of venue, which there's not here, the crime took place in Washington, D.C., then that judge should be accorded due respect. Welcome to the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practice Group's podcast, All Things Investigations. The Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practices Group represents many of the premier companies around the world, providing advice on issues spanning the full anti-corruption and compliance spectrum. In this podcast, host Tom Fox and members of the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Practice Group will highlight some of the key legal issues involved in white collar and other investigations, both domestically and internationally. We will tackle topical issues involved in investigations, as well as explore how companies can prevent and detect issues that arise in conducting investigations on a worldwide basis. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox, back for another episode of All Things Investigations in our continuing series on the Donald Trump indictments. Back again, Kevin Carroll and Kenyon Brown gents. A momentous, if not sad, week in Washington, D.C. I think that's an apt description. Whatever your politics are, it's a bad thing for the country that we've gotten to a place where necessarily and unfortunately, we've had to indict a former president for trying to overturn an election. Kenyon, I want to start with you because I want to maybe focus a little bit on the legal specifics of what we saw in this indictment. This was not an indictment for insurrection. This was not an indictment that Donald Trump cited the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol. It was something different. Could you explain what that something different is? Well, if this was a Netflix series, and I would borrow a phrase from a line in the indictment, it would be prolific lies. And those prolific lies were used to defraud, according to the government, the United States citizens in several ways and several election officials and slates of electors from the Electoral College in an attempt in seven states to replace them with false electors to the Electoral College. And so it has anywhere from 19 to 25 lies, depending on how you count them, to say that there was a broad conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election results. And there are four counts that are specifically set forth that say how specifically he did that. I was struck with the particularity of the evidence from the statements of public officials that were close allies of Trump in the states to people in Trump's close inner circle. They gathered evidence and statements from those folks, internal campaign emails describing their strategy that then crossed the threshold to something criminal to attorney-client privilege documents, which similar to the documents case shows that the government was able to pierce the attorney-client privilege with the crime fraud exception, that he also lied to some of the slate of class electors that he tried to put forward. They've got voicemails. They've got audio recordings, most notably that with Brad Raffenberger out of Georgia. So There is a lot of evidence there that if the government can put this forward, Trump's got real liability problems going forward. Evan, what are your initial impressions? To piggyback on something that Kenyon said, it's a very thorough speaking indictment, but Smith may still have cards up his sleeve, not necessarily as far as additional charges or anything, but he may have more evidence that he can deduce to prove the charges that have been brought. I'm very glad that the indictment was written in plain English. Really good legal writing. Reads like plain English, not full of jargon and Latin and so forth. I think any concerned citizen could read that 45-page document and understand what happened. Some people were hoping that Smith would include 
charges of sedition or insurrection, especially because the 14th Amendment provides the ability to bar from office, unless they're absolved by Congress, of somebody that's been involved in insurrection. But it appears that Smith decided to go for the first down rather than the touchdown, which is fine. All of the crimes that were charged or that could potentially have been charged all come with very serious sentences. And Trump's a 78-year-old man. It wasn't necessary for him to charge insurrection or seditious conspiracy or attempted murder of Mike Pence or something that might have been a bit more of a reach. One of the things that stood out to me and concerned me validated a fear that I had around the time of January 6th. In the conversations that are cited in the indictment between the deputy White House counsel and a political advisor, apparently Jason Miller, and Assistant Attorney General Clark, who was about to be named Attorney General at the time, Acting Attorney General, and John Eastman, I don't want to say the brains, the eminence agrees beyond this plot, the intellectual father to the plot. It's clear that they planned to do the following. They wanted Pence to invalidate the electoral slates of the blue states, or the states that voted for Biden, knowing that that would trigger riots in major American cities. And then they planned to use the Insurrection Act, which allows the president to use federal troops or federalized National Guardsmen to put down the violence. So the end game here was to basically provoke violence on the streets and then order the military to put down the violence, ending the dispute over the election. And that would overturn not just the Constitution, but going back even earlier to George Washington resigning his commission and refusing to be a dictator and the military happily agreeing to stay out of domestic politics. So I thought that, to me, was the most shocking part of the indictment. Let me ask about the unindicted co-conspirators. Almost immediately, five, there were six. Five were identified. One is, may have been identified. What's the significance, if any, of naming an unindicted co-conspirator in this type of plea? I think here, perhaps the value is, first of all, we can pretty fairly identify who they are. They're just behind a thin veiled screen there. But I think the value is there that some of these folks might flip on the president and testify. This gives them an opportunity to consider that as they go forward. But if I were them, I would kind of feel a little bit like that lobster in the jambalaya pot as things get heated up. But the point is they get more uncomfortable as things progress. And we know that a few of them have already had conversations with the Justice Department, Rudy Giuliani, for example. So it would be interesting to see how and when or if those folks come forward and provide testimony, evidence against the former president, their boss, and someone that they politically support. One of the things that stood out to me about the unindicted co-conspirators is that parts of our profession need to do some self-examination about how fellow members of the bar came here. There's former partners at very distinguished law firms. There's people who've clerked for appellate judges in the United States there. There's people who are on the full-time faculties of law school. That they would engage in an attempt to have a coup d'etat is something that's of real concern to me about the status of ethics training and professional discipline at the bar. As to one of the unindicted co-conspirators, as a New Yorker, it's just crushingly sad to see what's become of Giuliani. I grew up in New York. He was a hero to me as the mob-busting prosecutor back in the 1980s. And then obviously he cleaned the city up of street crime in the 1990s, and then he held the city together after 9-11. And the fact that it appears, judging by his statements yesterday, that he's not looking to cooperate, that Rudy Giuliani is going to die in federal prison as a sad drunk is just, I think, a real disappointment to many minds of people. He turned to the judge. What were your initial thoughts on the trial judge that was drawn for this case? I thought it was very interesting across the board in terms of the insurrection itself. I think nearly a thousand or more people have been indicted for their involvement in the insurrection. And this judge has heard many of those cases, of course, not a thousand, but she's heard many of the cases and has come out more harshly than the government with respect to requested punishments for several of the defendants involved in the insurrection. So I think that 
this is not necessarily going to be a favorable court for the former president if convicted, certainly. But it will be interesting to see her rulings as things progress. And there have been, for example, some statements by the former president that he can't get a fair jury in D.C. and he wants to remove it to West Virginia. Yeah, fat chance of that happening. This is a very well-qualified judge. She's been on the bench, I think, since 2014. And so she is well-seasoned in dealing with high-profile matters. I think she will acquit herself well, but probably not to the liking of Trump and the defense state. I wasn't personally familiar with the judge, so as soon as her name came out, I Googled her, and her Wikipedia entry had a photo of her. And my immediate thought was, that is not a woman who suffers fools gladly. <laughs> I've since seen pictures of her where she looks more relaxed, but she had a pretty severe picture. And as Kenyon said, she's extraordinarily well qualified. I'm sure that Trump supporters are going to throw a lot of racist and sexist accusations at her. And I hope that every decent person and every member of the profession stands up for the dignity of the federal judiciary. Judges come from all sorts of different backgrounds, and they're nominated by a president, and they're confirmed by typically a supermajority of the Senate. And it doesn't matter what their race or sex or religion or orientation is or whether they came up as a federal prosecutor or a federal defender or a partner to a white shoe law firm. They are a United States district judge. And unless there is a meritorious reason that they should recuse themselves or a meritorious reason that there should be a change of venue, which there's not here, the crime took place in Washington, D.C., then that judge should be accorded due respect. Let me just add that she was a former U.S. public defender as well. So she sat in the defense bar. She's defended cases. Her reputation seems to be that she will hold the government to its requirements and hold it strongly. What about a trial date? We have a May trial date in Florida. We have a March trial date and a civil trial in New York State. First of all, what would you ask for and what would you think might be reasonable? Wow, that's a hard question. Given the indictment and the number of individuals that it looks like the government will have to call, that the defense will then have to examine their statements and research it. I think it just goes, you know, the course of your typical fraud case in the quickest order. It could be six, seven months. It could be around the 10 month time frame. I think at the longest without deliberate stalling, which I don't think this judge is going to take. And you don't have the examination of classified documents and having to sift through that and all the kind of sidebar hearings you have to have in the documents case. So I think this one, it's going to move pretty quickly. It's a fascinating question about when the trial date is actually going to be. And I think a lot is going to depend upon a pretrial motion practice about what defenses the defense is going to be allowed to put forward. From their statements in the press over the last couple of days, it's clear that defense counsel wants to relitigate the entire 2020 election, even though there have already been 60 plus judicial proceedings related to the 2020 election. If, as I hope and suspect, the trial judge slaps that down and says that's a collateral issue, we're not going to have a trial within a trial. In as much as they're relevant, we're going to take the results of those other judicial proceedings in as evidence and not relitigate them. Then I think you could go quicker. On the other hand, if they decide that they want to call the collection of crazy folks that testified before state legislatures, for example, about this and relitigate the entire 2020 election, then it could drag on into a very long trial, which would suggest a later trial date. Another consideration is that most people agree this is going to be the most important trial in American history. So give all the counsel adequate time to get ready. Bottom line, I agree with sort of Kenyon's north-south estimates of what it could be. I guess it'll come in a little bit short of a year. It'd go to trial late spring, early summer next year. The chance that the New York, excuse me, the Manhattan prosecutor cedes his date in March for this trial? The Manhattan DA's office is famously disputatious with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York about things that happen in Manhattan. Maybe here, though, they would cede because it's another jurisdiction. And the 1-6 matter is clearly more important than the payoff to the sponsor. I'd like to end by going in a very different direction. 
Both of you have worked in government service. Kevin, you're still an active military. And I wanted to start off by asking the oaths you take, first for the military and then for the government, since I know you've had both, Kevin. And then, then I'm going to turn to you, Kenyon, with a different series of questions. But Kevin, when you raise that right hand to join the military, what does that oath mean? And is that something that you and your colleagues in the Army talk about? It absolutely is. I really respected my ROTC professor in military science, and he made us all read the Constitution before we were commissioned so that we would know what the heck we were planning to swear to defend with our lives. It's really important to everybody I know in the military. One of the things that you get from a good reading of the Constitution is that you're not swearing an oath to the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Armed Forces. You're swearing an oath to the Constitution and that the co-equal branches of government, whether that be federal judiciary or Congress, have an equal call on your loyalty. In as much as there were veterans in the crowd that day, in as much as there were a very small handful of active people in the crowd of rioters that day, that's just heartbreaking and embarrassing. The point was made at the time, the Confederate Army tried several times to get into Washington, D.C. As late as July of 1864, they got about as far as Rock Creek Park, actually, before they were turned back. Lincoln himself went out to watch the battle. And the Confederates were never able to get into the U.S. Capitol. Then on January 6th, you saw a Confederate flag being carried through the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol uh, through the Senate side. My great-great-grandfather fought in the Civil War for the Union Army as an Irish family member, and it just broke my heart. And there has to be some responsibility for what happened. Kenyon, I wanted to ask you, and I've wanted to ask you this for some time, what is it like to stand in open court and announce to the judge and jury or whoever you might be in front of that you represent people of the United States? How did that and how does that make you? I was going to say, Tom, there perhaps was no greater honor of my career than to start the day standing in front of a jury and saying, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kenyon Brown, and I represent the United States of America. And I knew what that meant and the weight of that statement and the trust that that conveyed to the jury members that I'm not just an advocate in the room, but I am sworn and upheld to certain duties and responsibilities of candor and of being a good steward of the information that I was going to share. So for someone to allegedly take actions against an oath of such magnitude, it's bothersome. It's like a prosecutor caring about the number of convictions rather than justice. And things get skewed in a way that they're not supposed to be. And I would like to shift and kind of piggyback on something that Kevin said. In the District of Columbia, only the president can call out the National Guard. And rather than call them out when he saw the Capitol being assaulted and the Capitol Police being overwhelmed, he sat back in the Oval Office and watched it unfold. And I think that that cannot be understated. In the States, the governor has that power. But in D.C., only the president. And he thought it would be to his benefit to let Congress feel the pressure of that moment, particularly Mike Pence, who was in the Congress or in the congressional space at that time. And I think he's got an uphill battle that is Trump in trying to convince the American people that his actions were legitimate. One of the reasons why I'm glad that the trial is in Washington, D.C., is that down here, you have neighbors who are Metropolitan Police Department officers, who are Capitol Police officers, who are congressional staffers. And, you know, we saw those cops being beaten with fire extinguishers and flagpoles and sprayed with bear spray and all these other kind of things. We saw or heard about congressional staffers, including, you know, young women and mothers, you know, huddled under desks as these crowds were rampaging down the halls, calling for their bosses to be hanged. And... I think it's important that the jury maybe include some people who have people like that in their life. Well, gentlemen, like I said, a momentous, if not sad week, but thanks so much for taking the time to visit with me and our audience on this. And I am sure we will be back together again. Thanks, Tom.